into my lesson today. You know, I was inspired in my quiet time a couple weeks ago by listening to a sermon by a great friend of mine in San Francisco, and it was all about being graceful. And this is actually a topic that in my Christian walk has been a challenge for me to truly embrace. You know, grace is such a deep word and has beautiful impacts on our lives if we choose to allow it. Mm -hmm. But when we think about grace as a whole, you know, the Bible talks about it so much. Mm -hmm. You know, I did a little research. Over 131 times is the word grace influence, and that's just because there's Hebrew words that can mean other forms like synonyms to grace, which multiplies it throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. But what I was most inspired by was how grace has even impacted the music industry. Mm-hmm. You know, grace is something that does just genuinely inspire people. And you guys know the famous hymn of Amazing Grace, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it comes with a beautiful history behind it. And I wanted to share a piece of that with you. Okay. It says, Amazing Grace was written by John Newton, an English slave trader uh, uh, turned minister. During his early years at sea, Newton mocked religion, but a near-death experience, which God likes to do, (laughs) changed his views. While caught in a violent storm off the coast of Brancana in 1748, Newton prayed the ship and the crew would be saved. Right after a crew member, member of the crew replaced him on the deck, the man was dashed into the waves and drowned. Newton and the rest of the crew survived the storm by a harrowing journey to land. For him, their salvation sparked a spiritual awakening. Despite his newfound faith, Newton continued to work in the slave trade. He retired for medical reasons in 1754 and then studied theology and became a minister in 1764. He wrote, I once was lost but now I am found, was blind, but now I see. And the rest of the stirring words that would go on to be amazing grace to accompany a sermon on the New Year's Day of 1773. You know, when I think about grace and this lasting impact on John Newton's lives, I think there's so much more power in the lyrics that can inspire both of us, to all of us today. And so when I think about grace and how it can often be hard to grasp, but it's so freely given. When I think about grace and its definition, there was so many to choose from. And I'm going to start with the biblical definition here. Grace, defined in the Bible, is seen as the love of God shown to the unlovely. The peace of God given to the restless. It's the unmerited favor of God. So you can't work for this. The Bible says, uh, or the definition from Merriam-Webster has various things to refer to grace. It was a name at one point, and it's a beautiful girl's name. In fact, when I was in high school, there's a lot of girls who had Grace or Marie as their middle name. Beautiful, because of its beautiful meaning. But the first definition I found, it says, it's describing God's grace. It says, unmerited divine assistance granted to humans for the regeneration and sanctification. Another form of grace is defined as your approval or the favor that you can receive. So this can come from another person. (laughs) Another funny one that it just brings back some memories of when I used to nanny before, even, even before I was a Christian is the short prayer at a meal and a blessing to give thanks. And I remember one time I was actually doing this and the girls didn't understand this. I had two, I had an 11 year old and she's like 12, two years younger. So she's like nine. I was, I made them a meal cause it was nighttime and their parents went out on a date and I uh, grabbed their hands and they were kind of looking at me funny. I said, let's say grace. And so I bowed my head and I was like, I won't say her name, <laughs> but she was, Really sweet. She looked at me and she looked at her sister and she was like, Grace. No. <laughs> and, and, and she thought it was like, 
like going to be some weird magic trick that would just spontaneously, I don't know, make the mood taste better or to make the food taste better. I don't know. But it was funny. I then had to demonstrate that this is a prayer and, you know, bless us the Lord for these ideas and the Brown Tasting. And like, yeah. you know, just teaching them the simple, uh, you know, traditions that I grew up on because grace was always a part of my lives, whether I, I, we recognized it or not. Grace is also a formal title. It could be used to address royalty. In uh, our European side, a duke, a duchess, or an archbishop would be referred to as your grace. But it also is your grace to our Heavenly Father, who is our royal figure. Come on. And also, this was a fun one that I wasn't aware of. It says it's a musical trill, so it's a musical term. And it's something Italian that I'm not even going to try and pronounce, <laughs> but it, it makes it sound good. You're just going to have to take my word for it because, you know, we're diving into grace and its definition together. And so when I thought about grace and how it has various definitions, its lasting impact can really influence our lives today. And I wanted to read about grace in the scriptures. Turn with me to Psalms 49. Yeah. The title of my lesson for you today is Amazing Grace. As you turn there to Psalms 49, I'm going to read to you the lyrics, the first stanza. And for every point, we'll look at the stanzas of the song. It says, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind and but now i see psalms 49 and when we get there we're going to pick up in verse 7. the bible says no one can redeem the life of another or give to god a ransom for them the ransom for a life is costly no payment is ever enough so that they should dot live on forever and never see decay now this isn't directly talking about grace but it does give us the platform to understand it you see the bible talks about grace as this unmerited favor but the psalms shows us how out of reach it is for you and i the price for our lives is completely out of our budget. It is too expensive to even conceive. The Bible says it's so costly. And I started to think about it like, you know, for our life, there's not another life that can ever exchange it. You know, if Emily was to volunteer right now and say, I want to take up Kayla's sins. You know, her death would be noble, but it wouldn't pay much. Right. You know, if Cher was back there saying, you know, her jolly old willing spirit would be, I can, I'm willing to lay my life down for Georgia because I love her. That's my sister. And as noble as that cause would be, it would do nothing. You see, the grace that God gives us is the most invaluable thing we could ever possess. Yeah. But how do we get it? What does it actually cost? That's what we're going to find in Romans chapter 5. Turn with me there. Come on, Talia. Romans chapter 5. Come on, T. Come on, Talia. All right. In Romans 5, we're going to start in verse 6. Come on, Talia. The Bible teaches, you see... Just at the right time. Because you know God is always on time. Whether you show up on time or not. And it's crazy because the timing of God is just so beyond us. I think of with this scripture, I think of Acts 17. He determines the times and places. And he shows up right for you. You know, it was not by chance that you showed up here today. Whether it's your first time or your 50th time. So it continues in verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I think if we were to pin grace 
in a scripture, this would be it. Yeah. Yeah. The price that's going to pay all our bills, all our, our, our debt to God was through Christ. And it's crazy to even think about when we consider paying a life for a life or dying, as the Bible says, like in history, it's not normal for us as people to be willing to sacrifice. In fact, it's very rare. Yeah. Although history might show some noble hearts being willing to lay their life down for someone who's great, worthy, or on their behalf, or maybe their family. We've seen this in history. We've seen this in the Bible. King David, in his righteous cause, people were willing to lay their life down and fight for him. You think of, you know, righteous, noble, historical figures like Martin Luther King or Malcolm X or like, uh, I think of incredible women who have laid their lives down for us and paved the way for great things. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says that God demonstrates And that's what I really love. God demonstrates. I mean, there's evidence behind this. He doesn't just say, I love you. Mm -hmm. You know, I I once heard that the Bible is just a bunch of love letters to the people and to you and I who choose to lay their lives down and obey it. But he doesn't just write it in the words. He demonstrates his own love for us. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says that he demonstrated his love before we even chose to be righteous. Mm -hmm. It says, while we were still sinners, that means you and I were enemies of God. And he chose to lay his life down for you and I. This, when you consider, gives a new meaning to those lyrics we just read. And that's why it really is a powerful punch to see how amazing grace is. I have two points for you today. The first point is, grace has a lasting effect. And the second point is, grace will work to make you perfect. Wow. Okay. The second stanza of Amazing Grace is, was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. When I thought about grace in the Gospels, I wanted to focus on how grace impacted the lives of women. And I couldn't help but consider how Jesus taught grace through the example of a sinful woman. Open up your Bibles with me in Luke chapter 7. But I'm going to do a little, I'm going to spice things up just a little bit. I'm going to read it. Oh, I'm going to read it from a different version today. But I still want you to follow along with me. It's in Luke chapter 7. And we're going to start at verse 36. Come on. In verse 36, remember I'm in the message version, it says, One of the Pharisees asked him over for a meal. He went to the Pharisee's house and sat down at the dinner table. Just then, a woman of the village, the town harlot, having learned that Jesus was a guest at his home of the Pharisees, came with a bottle of a very expensive perfume and stood at his feet, weeping raining tears on his feet. Then letting down her hair, she dried his feet and kissed them and anointed them with perfect perfume. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man was the prophet I thought he was, he would have known what kind of woman this is who was falling all over him. Verse 40, Jesus said to him, Simon, So we know his name. (laughs) Simon, I have something to tell you. Oh, tell me. Two men were in debt to a banker. One owed 500 silver pieces, the other 50. Neither of them could pay, and so the banker canceled both debts. Which of the two would be more grateful? Simon answered, I suppose the one who was forgiven the most. That's right, Jesus said. Then turning to the woman, but speaking to Simon, he said, Do you see this woman? I came to your home. You provided me no water for my feet, but she rained tears on my feet and dried them with her hair. You gave me no greeting, but from the time I arrived, she hasn't quit kissing my feet. You provided nothing of freshening up, but she has soothed my feet with perfume. Impressive. Impressive. 
isn't it? She was forgiven many, many sins. And so she is very, very grateful. If this forgiveness is minimal, the gratitude is minimal. Then he spoke to her, I forgive your sins. That set the dinner guest talking behind his back. Who does this think of he, he is forgiving his sins? And he ignored them and said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Wow. I love, love, love this passage only because you get to see the tender heart of Jesus with this woman. Yeah. You know, when you think about the culture and what is expected and how the world probably saw this woman, I love the message version because it uses those words that the Bible might, you know, shy away from and how we really talk. It called her a harlot. Uh, there's many names for a woman who had promiscuity, but it's really just, it's open to show that this woman was not a perfect person. Yeah. And I think it's something you and I can really relate to and identify. Because the Bible says in Romans 3 that we all fall short of the glory of God yeah. and that we all have sinned and it has the same reward nothing but death but if we're not careful in understanding this true grace we won't have a lasting effect you see when i was looking at this scripture in the interaction jesus was using this as an opportunity not just to teach simon about grace but you and i who are reading it today grace is so so important and when he was talking to this woman, I couldn't help but feel like he was talking to me. You know, when I had the time to reflect on my own sin, there was times where it was hard for me to really connect. And it was challenging because when I looked at this saying, the teaching, he said, those forgiven of much, you know, love much. And that was the lasting effect in her life. And in my mind, because I had somewhat of a sheltered background, I used to think, Maybe I need to go out there and sin a little bit more so I can have a little bit more love to give. And believe it or not, there are actual church doctrines that think of this in that way. We're going to read about it in a few. But I had to consider what that grace was going to have an effect in my life. What was I going to choose to believe? You see, when I was looking at this woman, I want you to be able to reflect on it with me. What is that lasting effect doing to you? Are you one who loves much or loves little? Are you in touch with the grace that forgiveness has affected in you? Are you aware of this? It's hard to think about because it's easy to forget. You know, there's this popular saying out in the world, familiarity breeds contempt, and it's a bunch of big words. But all it means is once you get comfortable, you start to get a little ungrateful. You know, what was once shiny and new starts to be, you know, yesterday's news. And it's crazy because when you think about relationships in that way, if we don't allow grace to penetrate our hearts, the very view of God in all his mercies, blessings and treasures can seem like yesterday's news too. We can get really familiar with God and start to take his grace for granted. That's why we have to stay close to this. Yeah. It is decisions to allow the grace to have an effect in you. But something we have to consider is all the false things that the world may try and make you believe about grace. They may think it of just a name or a title to address someone or some you know, song title in Italian, uh, Aprogato. Again, I can't pronounce it, don't ask me to, uh, but I'm sure it sounds great. But we have to consider what the Bible actually teaches. So I want to talk about what grace is, but also what grace is not. Let's go to the famous scripture in Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2. The author of this is named Paul, and he's actually known as the Apostle of Grace. You'd probably find if you couldn't read all his epistles, about 120 verses wow. that highlight the word grace are from him. Wow. Wow. You know, that's more than two-thirds of the amount of times grace is ever addressed. Wow. He was very impacted by the grace of God in his life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what is he trying to deliver to these Ephesians was really addressing a serious problem. You see, Ephesus was a predominantly Jewish nation, 
But God had opened the doors of the kingdom to all nations. Yeah. Yeah. So that means not just the Jews were saved, that grace was now extended to people like you and me. Because I don't know if you have any Jewish heritage back in there with you. It's pretty stereotypical. None of it, nobody really fits in unless you're good at accounting or I mean, not go there. Uh, it's, uh, like, but when I think about the, the grace that he was trying to teach is that when you are here trying to receive this grace, it's not just limited to how you live or who you come from. It's a choice to embrace it. But one of the things that the Jews were trying to basically enforce those who weren't of Jewish culture was holding to their laws, holding to these works that were really oppressive. The Jewish culture had many laws. If you go through Leviticus, it's countless, over 600 to hold to. From the Sabbath to what fabrics can go with what, how long we have to stay outside the camp as sisters when we have our cycles. It's crazy. But when you sit and look at the scriptures of what Paul tries to teach them, there's a lot of grace he has for you and I. Let's pick up in verse 1. Second uh, Timothy chapter 2, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2. We'll get to that other one later. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit is who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desires and thoughts, like the rest, were by nature deserving wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from your own, from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do the good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know, what was really special is that right when I was able to read this out, one of the girls who was studying the Bible in Dallas signed her signed this scripture in my Bible. And it was truly impactful to see her get baptized this past Sunday in a totally different church in Los Angeles. But I think of her when I think of grace now today. Why this scripture is so powerful is to know that there's no limitations on the impact of who grace selects. Meaning it can work for you, it can work for, you know, people who are older, people who are younger, for blacks, for whites, you know, from any type of walk of life, grace can have a lasting effect. But if we're not careful, we can slip into the mainstream teachings of grace and rob it of its riches. What has been taught about grace? We can take it to the extremes. We can look at verse 5 and say, I'm saved by grace. And let nothing and no one impact you. And we can be boastful about it. Most are really confident when they sit on this, you know, saved by grace teaching. Now understand this, I'm not going against scripture. It does say saved by grace there. But we can't take these to the extremes. we got to read the Bible as a whole. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It also comes from the idea, like, you know, with grace, you know, it's a, a beautiful teaching. And it's sometimes the foundation of people's doctrines, which this is not all the, to the message or the gospel of God. There is so much more. What do I mean by this? They, they, they could puff themselves up and say, it's by grace and grace alone. Or, you know, grace and faith are interchangeable. So it's by faith alone. And that nothing and anything else could be expected from you or I. You know, Paul has to correct this in some churches back in Rome. Because they thought, you know, because I have so much sin, 
I can have way more grace. So the more I sin, the more grace there is. And then God's just enjoying this rich party of grace and bring it all on me. And we justify our actions. This is where this cheap form of Christianity comes from. It's cheap. Dime a dozen, anybody can find it. You know, this is where what gives the license for people to come into church and live how they want to and slap a little, you know, I'm a Christian bumper sticker or, you know, put it on the back of their car or put it on their Facebook or Instagram, you know, intro saying like, disciple first, Christian all about Jesus. And you have all these wicked pictures or maybe just like wicked comments, hateful distractions of like, you know, tearing people down. Mm. But that's not what Christ is all about. In fact, my Bible says, yes, that we are saved by grace and that there is supposed to be a lasting effect. What is that effect supposed to have in you? When Jesus was teaching us about this sinful woman, the impact it had on her completely transformed her. She went from being shunned from the world and brought herself to the center of attention to pour herself out for God. She didn't care what others thought or didn't care what they were doing. She simply came and gave complete worship to him. That's what should, it should be for you and me. Sometimes when we teach this idea, when they're, when you approach someone of this faith, it's like they're very puffed up. It's hard to even penetrate their heart because they're, they're so set on this scripture and they hold yeah. tight to it. But it's important to be able to read it with in conjunction with the rest of the scriptures yeah because how do we know this grace is an effect in our lives well it does say in verse five let's go back there Um, it means being made alive in christ even when we were dead in our transgressions and it is by grace that you have been saved now drop down to verse seven it says in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches showing you it's not cheap of his grace expressed in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. You see, in order for us to have access to grace, we first must understand our faith. Now, you gotta ask yourself, what is faith? You know, I wanna make this interactive. Raise your hand, what do you think faith is? Anyone? All right, I'm gonna go with Mary. To believe something that you don't see yet. Okay, so to believe in something you can't see, no proof. How about you, Cloudy? Confidence. Okay, there's confidence. Yes, that comes from Hebrews 11. How about you, Tamia? Hope. Hope. Yeah. It's definitely connected to Hebrews 11. We gotta have hope in this faith. How about you? In action based on belief. Yeah, we, and honestly, when we think about faith, it's hard to grasp because just like yeah. grace, deep in its definitions, but I wanna show you from the Bible how it connects us to it. Yeah. What does it actually take? Let's go to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Why this is important is because sometimes we can use this grace as an excuse to get out of the amazing works that God is calling us to do. So again, I want to remind you, this is not to, I I basically just want to prepare you all. When we go out there, it's not bad. You know, even as a woman, it's not bad to know your Bible, nor is it bad to be able to defend your, your doctrine, the teachings of what it says for slight corrections. It's honestly a part of our role as a disciple, as a Christian, to know what the Bible teaches. So I hope you can take notes with these and be able to share them with your friends who may think you can have any life with this grace and power. So in James chapter 2, when it des- describes faith, the Bible expects in verse 14... Why? Saying, what fit is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Mm-hmm. Now, pause here for a minute. This does not mean that the Bible is contradicting itself. Mm-hmm. What do I mean by this? The works that Paul was talking about in Ephesians 2 was the very oppression that Ephesus was having on those who weren't Jews. Mm-hmm. He's talking about works of the law. Mm-hmm. Not talking about not working at all. Mm, yeah. So there's a difference. If we continue in how the Bible describes faith, it actually confirms that grace that we've been following since Luke. Mm. Go back with me in verse 14. Come on. Can such faith save them? Mm. Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, 
keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But some will say, and this is what they say, so just know this is not a new teaching. There's actually nothing new under the sun, as it says in Ecclesiastes. So what we hear that's popular today, they said it way back then in Jesus' time too. Verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. All right. Verse 20. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not the father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God. So there's evidence of our belief. And it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. I want to tell you something. Every time I uh, address this topic, and it can come from many different people who simply do not under understand the scriptures as a whole. This is why I have so many scriptures in the very first point. Not my tradition, but you know, we're going to keep it you know, rich with scriptures so you can be equipped. So the Bible says it's going to equip you for every good work, so beware. You have to use it all. We can't just single out one. There is no cherry picking of the Bible here. So when it comes to this, you can't say that I'm all about faith alone. Because the only time we see alone and faith together is the word not right before it. So let's not use the Bible to contradict the Bible with these crazy extreme teachings. Grace is rich and powerful. It is not cheap. It is not free, but it is freely given to you and I if we choose yeah. to receive this. Come on. Yeah. Why is this hard for most to accept? Because not many people want to act on this faith. Mm -hmm. We can think about it as an intellectual thing. Because I know God, because I can call on his name and the Lord Jesus just comes in you. Uh -huh. <laughs> that you and I can have a relationship just upon that, that profession alone. This, my sisters, the Bible says, is not faith. Faith requires that action, meaning there's evidence. Yeah. Remember in the beginning, Jesus showed his love. He didn't just say it. He didn't just accept it in his heart like a fifth grader who wants to be a part of the cool kids. What do you think Jesus is? King, not a kid. Come on. We have to be those who choose to follow him. It requires obedience, faith without deeds. He compares it to a demon. Mm. He says, what separates your faith from them? Mm. Is there any difference? Can you show it? Because my faith has proof. Come on. Mm. you got to be able to hold this. It is not weird. It is not bad. It, you know, don't leave it to the brothers to just know their Bibles. This is why we're doing Bible. But cussing up the storm, and you're like, wait a minute, where'd you just come from? No. <laughs> I tell you this, it was so funny. I, I considered grace. Don't don't laugh at me because you know it was a moment. I remember coming out of church one day, and I was with uh, a couple of the brothers. We were going to Safeway. It was really funny. It was for lunch. We were in between leaders and church, and we were just going to the deli to get some chicken. On Sundays, it was called Five Dollar Fridays. Mm -hmm. I had no idea in my mind what you know this meant. But I remember walking in excited, hanging with the brothers. We were just chopping it up. And I get there and I see $5 Fridays. And I say to the deli man, I said, I got five on it. And I was like, and he looked at me and he said, y'all just come from church? Right. And I looked at him and I said, yeah. He said, and he just looked at me with those judging eyes. And, and then the brothers had to say, hey, Talia, you gotta understand. Do you know what that song is about? I have no idea. That could be some of us about grace. We could have all about, like, you know, I'm all about it. I got five on it. Not knowing that 
that song is about drugs. Right. How did we run over here? I was like, I just wanted a five dollar chicken meal. I just, I, I was just, we didn't understand it. Sometimes we need to have that humble grace in our lives to understand that there needs to be some quick corrections. It is okay to allow this grace to have a lasting effect in your life, but are you willing to receive it? I want to encourage you. If this is something that you didn't quite understand about the Bible in the beginning, take the person who brought you out and consider going through a Bible study on what exactly grace teaches. Because I only have, you know, a few more minutes with you. That take leads me to my second point. Grace will work to make you perfect. The second, the third stanza of Amazing Grace reads, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. Tis grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I told you we'd go back there. 2 Timothy chapter 2. All right, someone's with me. In verse chapter 1, or 2 chapter 2, verse 1, it says, You then, my son, this is Paul speaking again, be strong in the grace. That is in Christ Jesus. In the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. Join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to police his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, says the Lord, and I will give and the Lord will give you insight into all of this. I love this passage because it holds a very impactful statement. The Bible says be strong in the grace and it's like, how do we remain strong in the grace? Well, for us to understand it, we have to take Paul's direction and reflect on these things. You know, Paul talks about a farmer, a soldier, and an athlete. And he says, reflect, meaning trying to find their similarities. What do they have in common? And to be honest with you, this took me a long minute. Like, I, I don't know how long. I was going through commentaries after commentaries. And then I had to just pray through this verse. I said, what does a soldier do? What does a, uh, an athlete do? What does a farmer, how do you, like, what kind of, it doesn't fit. It's not, you know, obvious. So through this reflection, I started to just write out, what does a farmer do, soldier do? What does an athlete do? And ultimately, I saw that, the only similarities that I could find really was that each and every field was a reference to a spiritual walk with God. You know, the Bible talks about it being a battle and we are soldiers, a part of this godly battle fighting against the forces of Satan. Wow. You know, God also yeah. uses the parable of the sower to define our hearts and how it's a choice to remain wow. in him. But I also think about what it means to be an athlete. Yes. And how the Christian walk has always been taught uh -huh. like a race, yeah. not a sprint, but a marathon. Yeah. But even deeper was the principle that each and every person that, the, that Paul's defining here was known for rigorous, hard work. Yeah. And I had to think about that. Being strong in the grace really is directly related to some hard works. Mm -hmm. Another reason not to be sold on this, like, I'm all about the faith alone without the works. Let me, let me be aware. It's here in the scriptures, too. There's a pattern. God always leaves his signature. But when we think about the Bible, it says this is the handiwork of God. How can we understand God's grace? And when I was going through the Gospels in graceful moments throughout the scriptures, like I said, I'm focusing on Jesus' impact on women. Very quickly, go with me to Luke chapter 4. Aww. Luke chapter 4, and honestly, we do not have the time to go through all of the scriptures, but it was crazy as I was reflecting on all those three things. Jesus was working really hard in this passage. If you look at all the titles that address Luke 4, I mean, Jesus was really busy. It says he heals many. Jesus gets tested in the wilderness, fasting for his ministry. 
He gets rejected in Nazareth for preaching the word day and night. He heals a person from an impure spirit. But ultimately, I want to focus on his interaction with this, you know, middle-aged woman here. In verse 38, it says, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon, Simon the disciple. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up and at once began to wait on them. When I was reflecting on this, I was like, man, the grace that's going on in this woman's life as she's being healed, which does talk about salvation. I'm not talking about healing and being healed from a sickness is the same. But the impact of it was the grace that God took time out of his crazy schedule. And remember, he's going from city to city preaching with the disciples. And he said, hey, we're not too far. Would you mind healing my you know, mother-in-law? She's down with a fever. And in the moment when he heals her, it always just shows you that God has a heart for other women. So he takes the time to work for them. But it was almost like it was instilled in her as a culture. The first thing she does is gets up and she starts to wait on them. She starts to work. And I don't think it's by chance that this woman is a mother also. Yeah. You know, I think about grace in the pact of people's lives. It's always embedded into the DNA of a mom. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, you know, uh, quote me on this. Just look at the patterns of your parents. It's in there. I promise. Moms are the hardest workers you can ever know. And they immediately sick, you know, when they're well, when they're tired on their birthday, on their, you know, on Mother's Day, they'll be doing something. And it's crazy because that was the culture of the impact of grace. It made you work to become perfect in this way. Now, not saying that moms or anyone who works for God is without sin. I wish. Unfortunately, it's not. But that perfection of us choosing to work like Jesus does reflect his light in this completely dark world. And so it made me reflect on this culture that Jesus was beginning. You know, I think about uh, moms in the kingdom who've gotten baptized. And I did talk to the sister as we were, uh, you know, going through her conversion. I got to study the Bible with Miss Shauna just last year. And one of my favorite things to brag on her about was the beautiful conversion she went from. Now, her daughter was the first to come into the kingdom and was baptized a couple years ago. And then after her, her son came in, Jashan, Jashan, who you see working with the AV. You know, but Shauna was a little bit skeptical about the church in the beginning. Uh, I wouldn't go as far to say a persecutor, but she had some words to share with us. And you know what? This has been, regardless of it, I've always loved my job and what I do. And I believe it's beautiful with every step that I take. And I tell you, she taught me a lot in every moment. And I remember studying the Bible with her when she allowed the opportunity. She came in. And I remember just going through the basic protocols because I'm over here at 27 at the time. And I said, uh, how old are you, Miss Shana? She told me 47. So she's 20, 20 years my senior. We're all women. We can put this. I, I talked to her. She's, oh, never mind. She's saying no. Don't put her age out there. Ah. <laughs> Pretending in here. No. <laughs> We, put, we were talking about, you know, I know I don't have a lot of life experience, but there's a lot of grace in the effect in my life that I'd like to share with you. And it was a beautiful transition of me just being able to share the scriptures and what the Bible allowed in, her, uh, in our relationship was that it could go both ways. And to be honest with you, it wasn't just Mishana who was learning. I was learning too. too. And she had life lessons to share with me. I learned a lot about what I'm going to use for my future children, far mm-hmm. in the future. Right. And, <laughs> and I, looked at it and I remember getting to the points where we were talking about true transformation. Mm-hmm. And the moment Shauna hit the waters of baptism, I saw a complete 180 in her life. Mm-hmm. When it came to reservations, the mm-hmm. guards were down. Yeah, completely. And her arms were wide open. It was almost uncanny to see that immediately when she got saved, she started to work. I kid you not, she has her hands in just about every ministry known to the church. She's back there with A.V. right now. Technically, she's not supposed to be back there. She, she's been from administration. She's the birthday deacon. She's at work most of us. 
Anyway, but I think mean, that is clap worthy. We should try to throw some more clap show it was yes. a complete transformation she went from being the one you know watching us i can't uh, hold my no. arms that well ah! got a little tight sweater oh, on but so she was walking from, she came from being in the back on the sides to now she's one of those who are even participating in services oh, so far yeah. and what i love about this is because that was the culture jesus expected yeah. you know when it came to grace it will always work to make you and i perfect yeah when i thought about working and the grace impacted i was coming across a special feature that was a movie that came out a couple of years ago in 2019 it was about harriet tubman and the woman who was whose life was spared trying to escape years of slavery brutality and hardship when i was watching this movie it couldn't help but pair you know spiritual analogies to it is not our walk with God, you know, slavery to our sin? Do we know nothing better than the hardship that the world has bred us in? But the moment we come into contact with Jesus, should it change us to be workers for him? I wanted to leave you with just the trailer so you can be inspired to watch this on your own. So I'm going to ask those in the back to hit the lights. And yeah, enjoy. <laughs> There's not much time. You got to be miles away from here for God. Where's that? Follow that north star. If there are no stars, you just follow the river. Listen for them. Fear is your enemy. Oh, easy now. I'm the fear of death. I don't know if you know how extraordinary this is, but you have made it 100 miles to freedom all by yourself. Would you like to pick a new name to mark your freedom? Harry Tubman. You are welcome here anytime. If I'm free, my family should be too. I made up my mind, I'm going back. You're confident, composed, when trouble comes. You'll be ready. Papers. It says here you're five and a half feet tall. You ain't more than five feet. Must have won my high boots that day. Why you back here? He ain't safe. I come to get you. Bring all of you to freedom. Do you know what would happen if you got caught? You got lucky, Harriet. I made a diss for all my own. So don't you tell me what I can't do. Harriet, welcome to the Underground Railroad. Everybody, everywhere is looking for you. God don't mean people to all people. Thief and burn her at the stake. I will give every last drop of blood in my face until this monster called slavery is dead. Ready? But there were so many spiritual allegories that even relate to the song that we're reflecting on today in Amazing Grace. And why I thought about Harriet, not only was she a woman, but she was a woman who had the courage to work. She was so impacted by being able to make it through that hundred mile journey that made me think of the athlete. And immediately when she was free, she said, I must continue. My work is not finished. She said, I would rather die than do anything else. And I said, if I were to reflect on the true impact of grace in our life, should we, we not work the same? Yeah. Should our hearts be concerned for all those who have not embraced the freedom that we enjoy in this kingdom yeah. here today? Yeah. I think it's so powerful to be able to see who is working in the kingdom right now. Consider the people whose 
faces are new to you today. Mm -hmm. That should be an example of this, but we need so much more. Yeah. We need to fill this room up yeah. with how much grace there is in store for all of you. On, you see, what's beautiful is that this message can impact anyone who yeah. chooses to let grace influence them. Come on. Wow. And I believe if we are all like Harriet or like Mishana, mm -hmm. if we're willing, so I got a little exercise for you. You gotta raise your hand with me, and all I can raise is at a 90 degree angle. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, all of you can raise your hand. First step is you gotta be willing to work. But let me tell you a promise. Clench that hand like a fist. Now you have a muscle. God says that when you work for him, that he and grace will make you strong. And that's what I want you to remember about this. We all are made strong and equipped for the work of helping another out of the slavery that the world has only offered them. If they only choose to. I want to encourage you, if you haven't had a friend out, share your own testimony with yeah. them. Uh -huh. That testimony of grace in your life can impact many more just yeah. like you. Yeah. So I want to close with the last stanza of Amazing Grace, and it's how we started. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found and now I'll be set free. Come on. You see, the grace of God truly is the most powerful thing in this world. Mm -hmm. And it has a lasting effect in you and I if we so choose to. Mm -hmm. But we must be willing to raise our hands and God will make us strong so that we can reflect a perfect world through you. Thank you so much for letting me share.